least we have sunshine finally. I haven't seen the sun in days. Awesome. Take it off, Mario. What happened to Devin? Ah, there he is. Sorry. I was trying to see All that right. picture of mine. All right, good play it, people. Mario here. And I'm excited that the whole Plant Nerd gang is back together again. Michelle, the queen, Maven, millennial makeover herself. Kata, you're back in the castle, but we're going to move you to princess. And Devin, the Duke of 8B, and your territory, your kingdom is expanding. USDA just launched the new hardiness zone map. North Florida, welcome to Atlanta. So tell us why this is significant. Let's jump into this breaking news. 23 hardiness zone map. The lines have changed. While we're talking about it, I'm going to go ahead and present it. So who wants to take the first like stab at why this is important? I think, well, I, mean... the, <laughs> I think it's the most important because that means I didn't suck at doing some perennials, but they were just not meant to grow in Raleigh, North Carolina, because we are officially now at zone eight. And I have been trying to do so many zone seven and they never worked. And I thought I was a bad gardener and I'm not. It's the plant, it's oh. not you. It's the plant. Exactly. It's the climate. So well, this like since I've been in the industry, this is the second time the map has changed. Cause I think it was back I'm trying to remember the last time it changed, because I remember Atlanta yeah. used to Yeah, because Atlanta used to barely be seven exactly. and six was like right there north of us. And now I mean they changed it and Atlanta became from a seven A to seven B and now goodness, look at this. Seriously, like mean? literally we're all the same now. Really. Devin, from a plantsman, like what it, what's going to change? Like what should the modern homeowner really understand about this kind of change? I mean, it's well, like the biggest thing when these things change like this is, you know, you've got to be really careful when you're picking like a perennial, like Kata said. So if the perennial is like a five to seven and you're at the, you know, top of that hardiness zone, you've got to be really careful because, you know, it's getting hotter and that plant's not going to do well, like Kata said. So, you know, I always worry with perennials. Like I look at it, if I'm at the top of the hardiness zone, I'm really worried that it may not make it through the cold or vice versa. It may not make it through the hot. So um, you got to be, you want to be in that sweet spot in the middle. So I think it'll... it gives you so many like new opportunities though. Like, like you just mentioned a little bit, like, now maybe you can be a little bit more brave spending a lot of money mm -hmm. on something that actually said eight that before it was kind of a risk but now you can feel much more confident to do something that might have not been okay yet um on the flip side i think it's also totally okay to taking those risks and maybe if you have something that's a zone seven but now you're a zone eight just plant it at a different time of the year don't plant exactly. it in August go full on fall planting. Like I'm such a huge fan of fall planting because it really establishes well. And then it come, you know, has a better survival chance in the summer. So I don't think it's like all a bad thing other than for humans, because it now really means it's very hot. Yeah. Although I but think I it's... Mean, and... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say also, don't be scared. So like if you have like a perennial that is a zone seven, that's been there for years, like now that it's a zone eight, this is one of my favorite things is plants aren't very good at reading. So they're not going to know that the zone changed They're They've acclimated They're The plants are really good at adjusting the climate. So they're going to actually be able to take the hotter because they've been used to it. I mean, God, they made it through last summer. I don't know how hot it was last summer. And that's probably why the map changed so much. But um don't worry everyone your plants are not gonna die if it's a zone seven and we're eight now they'll be okay they just might need a little more water yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me level set on some plant nerdery about the usda hardiness map and what it means and and i'm just pulling this from plant nerd ai so the u.s hardiness zone is a tool that gardeners and landscapers use to determine which plants is most likely to thrive at a location and the map is based on the average annual minimum winter temperature divided into 10 degrees Fahrenheit zones. So, for instance, Georgia occupies 6 to 8B, 6B to 8B, 
each major zone is divided into that cooler upper portion and the warmer lower portion of each zone, which is the A and the B. So uh, cooler is the A and then warmer is the B. This allows for greater accuracy identifying hardy plants. And thus hardy perennials, both herbaceous and woody, are assigned to hardiness zones ranked based on the hardiness of each plant. For example, a plant that's hardy in zone 7 to 10 can withstand the minimum temperatures of those zones. So. I don't know if plant um, really like we, we had to, you know, kind of create a home base and definition as we as we dive deeper into this. And I think it's significant for a lot of the people that grew up, you know, thinking, oh, this plant does fine here. And because I think the line now that we see is at the northern part of the state, this line used to be where Macon was, right? It was the Nat line. And they've just mm -hmm. adjusted everything up almost, uh, you know, a letter, essentially, or a half of a zone. Is that, is that fair to kind of interpolate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can you can just notice it in the plants themselves. I mean, I remember, you know, not, I remember seeing big, huge rhododendrons in Atlanta. I mean, huge mm -hmm. rhododendrons, eight, nine feet tall. And, you know, nowadays, I, I always personally try to steer everyone clear of rhododendrons in Atlanta just because it's so hot now. They don't do well. But the ones that have been there, been through all the hot and gotten used to it, they can make it. But when you go to try to plant a new one, it just... Rhododendron is a prime example of the, the change in the climate in the Atlanta area and all over. But but at the flip side, you also like me working at a company that is really like um, forward thinking and breathing and everything. A lot of the breeders do have this focus in mind to really make plants more heat and um, humidity tolerant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just because also we always had in our mind XYZ plant doesn't work in the South because it's way too hot. Doesn't mean that like some of the new cultivars don't work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, talk to the people in your garden center. They know. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely coming out with all sorts of cool new plants that can take the heat and be more cold hardy and everything like that. So it's yeah. always yeah. new things. And then we can all try new things now that's a little bit warmer. I just I want know. my yard to be, I want to be zone nine now. <laughs> You're getting closer so, to that citrus prime growing. So, you know, as we talk about sort of the, you, you know, this is the mechanical things about it, but philosophically, you know, we talk about native plants and we talk about plants that have always been here. And I think it's, I always talk about my clients that, you know, these zones have changed throughout way before man or a woman, you know, graced the earth. Uh, these things have been changing. These are long-standing migratory shifts and climatic patterns. Um, and so, what is native a hundred years ago is not what's native ten years ago. Will not be what's native a hundred years from now. So, how do y'all look at this? And how do y'all look at? Okay, does that mean that certain palms that were native to South Georgia, we are now going to say, will become native? in the Atlanta, formerly known as Zone 7B. I mean, y'all see what I'm saying here? I mean, Michelle, mm -hmm. I see you nodding your head because I know that you have a couple of conversations about native plants. How are you going <laughs> to navigate these conversations? Oh, those conversations are really uh, fun because like you said, there are plants that acclimate over time and right, what was native here when things were Zone 6B were, are not going to be native when they are zone um 8a now which is always really weird to say um and i don't know when i'm trying to add things to the garden i'm looking for things that are that sweet spot because even though the zones shifted we had the coldest winter last year in i don't know how many mm -hmm. years and i lost all of my tender shrubs that were the zone 8 plants that i kind of pushed it cuz i've always thought we were you know riding the line and it'll be fine so um I, I I look more carefully now at the, you know, zones and I try to stick with things that are, you know, somewhat in the middle. I mean, I'm still, I'm worried about my conifers and there are a lot of conifers that I've planted that, you know, aren't, we're, I was hoping we'd stick to more of a zone seven <laughs> um, and clearly we're, it's getting hotter. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah. crazy to think about 
I mean, it is, but it always is changing. Like Mario said, it does go, it's been changing for years and it goes up, it'll go down, it'll be all around. So it's just, it's crazy though, to like see it on paper. You know, it's really yeah. actually interesting. A lot of people don't realize that the um, those maps are very, very typical for um, the U.S. So when I moved here from Austria, everybody was like, oh, which zone are you in in Austria? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like uh, zones and like using zones so frequently in the horticulture industry, but even like in retail um, is was totally new to me. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense in Austria. I'm not aware of any like really comprehensive maps for Europe because sometimes one mountain and, you know, can change yeah. the climate. Like our Alps, they change it within 10 miles. And so we always had to much more really be smart about what our experience is and our, what our garden looks like and what our microclimates within our garden look like. Um, so we grew up gardening in a very, very different way. And we couldn't just look at a label and say, oh, it says 7A, I'm 7A, this needs, this will be perfect. Like still might mean you have the wrong soil, you have the wrong microclimate. Um, so yeah, it was really, really a new concept for me to learn. Um, that being said, I do think it's a very great starting point, especially for new gardeners that don't have the years of experience in a garden. Yeah, blending both what Devin had talked about, how plants just don't read, and the idea yeah. that the USDA, the US and USDA is United States, you know, Department of Agriculture. This is a, a human crafted thing for homeowners to, to better understand the climactic challenges on plants and how plants survive in particular winters and such. Um, so and I, I have think actually one great question that, I do not know the answer to, but what I'm now, because I mean, this is really breaking news. It came out this week. I've been traveling all week. I had no idea, uh, like no time yet to talk to anybody else about this. But like, if we list on a label that this plant, this new plant is a plant 8A, did we put it on there because we trialed it in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is why we say it's an 8A? Or are we saying that it's an 8A because the genus is an 8A? So with us changing that map, does that mean we actually have to update also our labels? Because where, oh. how did we come up with this? So that doesn't actually naturally mean to me, if I'm right in what I'm thinking, that we cannot plant certain plants anymore because we might have still trialed them in your area. And this means they're still going to be fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I mean, they may be able to adjust the tag on the plant if they trial it. And, you know, it was formerly a seven, but they trial it now and it does well. They could move it to an, they could move the zone on the label, too, if they just yeah. do some trialing. So but I think it, there is still a lot of questions with this new map. Thing. Yeah. Well, I think so. Like it's always. Go ahead. I was going to say, the zone thing's always wonky, too, because, like, I was just dealing with a customer and she wanted to grow. She was down in Florida and wanted to grow all this stuff that, like olives and stuff like that, that do great in California. Yes. And she's like, I don't understand why this plant isn't going to grow in Florida for me. I mean, it says it's a zone nine, and I'm a zone nine. And I'm like, yes, but it's the humidity down there that really, really will get like olives. They do not do well with humidity. And so it's like zones are one thing, but you also have to have some knowledge and experience. Like, Kata said, with your microclimate, I mean, the Southeast isn't really a microclimate, but it's definitely way more humid than California. Well, and you can't grow plants back and forth. One thing that is always missed, it's the UD USDA hardiness zone. There is heat maps. We have yeah. like actually talked extensively within the horticulture industry, how the, not just the hardiness zone maps should be a thing, but also the heat index zones but it would make the label much more complicated and everything, you know, you would have to try totally different, but that is something that people always understand. Like saying it's an eight doesn't mean it survives the heat of an eight. It just means how cold does it get in winter? Not how hot does it get in summer and how humid. Yeah. I get questions like that all the time. So folks in Arizona going like, Oh, I'm right on the edge. How do you think limelight will do? And I'm like, uh, uh -uh. <laughs> 
I don't know, but I don't think I'd fight them in full sun, you know? Uh, uh, they do not do well. Yes, definitely. They will not definitely bloom. Yeah, and I think one of the things to underline, and Kata, I think that you said it really well, and I think that, Michelle, you're touching on it, is this idea of microclimate. And one of the ways in which I would, I always tell people about microclimate is you have to look at this. You have to start with slope aspect. What is slope aspect? That is the, the di cardinal direction in which the slope faces. So, or whatever landscape you're doing. So if it faces north, um, you're going to get colder temperature. If it faces south, you're going to get warmer, west, more dry, east, more moisture. And, um, you know, it, it brings a lot of these maps to Kata's point, like down to somebody's landscape. So they can kind of understand that their whole, within just one property, you can have multiple microclimates and then lend itself to certain plants that are going to thrive in certain situations and conditions just within. So you could create a USDA hardiness map coupled with a heat index, coupled with a humidity just in one property. And, that, and you know, landscape architects do that all the time through their site analysis. Um, and I, maybe I'm just advocating for me as a professional or the profession itself. <laughs> but, you should. But you this, should. Is, this is what landscape architects do. They determine these types of site conditions on every property we go to. And, these, and there's more, more layers than that because you got to add hydrology and cultural influences and biological influences. So, uh, soil, yeah. soil, acidity, pH, you know, all these huge. Things. All right. So, USDA, big thing. Uh, uh, we're going to, Servscape's going to write a blog about it. I know Michelle's going to have some information. Everybody's going to have more information on it. So, we'll continue to have these kind of talks. I think it would be interesting to follow up on like who, how uh, some of the big companies are going to be trialing and what does this mean for the, some of the labels? I think we need to do some follow up on that. Yeah. But I do want to take the conversation to what is growing on and where the, where in the world is Devin? Because it seems like everybody's somebody of, of the four of us, we're, we're, somebody's always traveling. So Devin, let's start with you. Where are you? And then we're going to move into what's growing on. I am in Naples, Florida right now. Um, at an Airbnb, it's a little urban farm. We've got cows and chickens and goats out here. Um, had to migrate south where it was warmer. I think it's like 85 degrees here. This is amazing. The sun's finally out because it was raining. We were up about an hour and a half north of here and we had to come down more south to find the sun, and find a pretty beach to go to. So I've been on vacation and have not been able to have a day on the beach the whole entire you trip. You totally go to Naples Botanic Garden. It is the single best botanic garden in whole of like Southeast. I love it. Was there yesterday. Isn't it It awesome? was amazing. Oh my God. It's so cool how like there's no greenhouses. There's just orchids and all these cool palms and tropical plants everywhere. So it was awesome. awesome. Yeah. So we went there yesterday. It was great. Cool. Why so, did I even like question that you would not? <laughs> I'm I'm such a do you want to talk about, find it. Devin, do you want to talk about, did you see any of these places or do you want to talk about it at all yeah i mean the palms were incredible i mean i've never seen so many different palms to see them from all over um and it was cool because we actually went with uh my roommate his aunt and well his two aunts and me and sal were like giving them a personalized tour of the whole botanical gardens because we got to show them the rainbow eucalyptus which is by far one of my favorite that was, pictures. i love that thing i mean plants I don't know if you can pull up a picture, Mario, yeah, to show what a rainbow you put. Eucalypt is so cool. They are so awesome. It has got the most amazing eucalypt. Are, are these? No, the trunk. That trunk. So I look at the trunk. The left hand corner under the light up, like just this one. No, below the trunk. Yeah, go one more down, one more down. That, that this trunk. This is it, right? There, yeah. Yep, that's it. So it's cool how the bark exfoliates and you oh, get yeah. all these different colors in the bark. I mean, you get green, red, blue, looks like a little bit of purple. There, It was incredible to see. They had like four great big ones right when you walk in the garden. So that was cool. Um, the orchids were phenomenal. They're just all over everything there. It's just funny. They just zip tie them to the palms and it's just like, Orc is blooming all over the place and they don't have to do anything. And um, it was just cool because um, Sal's aunts were there and 
they were always talking about their members and they were like, we, they live super close to it. And they're like, we come here every single week and something's always different in bloom. And so it was a, it was an awesome experience. The water lily or water. Yeah. The water lilies were all in bloom. It was gorgeous. They had the great big ones that you can like put a kid on and it'll float in it like a little canoe. Um, and I just love, love, love their orchid collection. Like it is so out of this world. It's amazing. And the coolest thing is like, I'm used to going to the Atlanta Botanical Gardens and it's in the greenhouse, but down here, because it's, it's so outside. hot all the time. It's just outside. It's just outside. outside. That's awesome. It was cool. It was a really fun experience. That's amazing. Um, all right, Michelle, to you, what is growing on? I have a couple of things I wanted. I think I'm going to pull up some of your slides. Yeah, I sent you some pictures of things that are looking good. I don't, I'm just doing like the general cleanup and um, things around, but I noticed that, and I have this problem that once I find a good camellia, I, so this is autumn rocket and I love it because of the way it grows. Like it's very slender and upright and then it's just so gorgeous. So Sometimes I find the camellias that bloom later, like there's the early spring blooming camellias, and I can't think of the botanical kind of family that they fall into, but sometimes those will get zapped, and I don't get as nice of a bloom as these that bloom in the October time frame, and I just, I love October rocket, or autumn yeah. rocket. Yeah, the, the, so those are sasanquas. So Sasanquas, the way I yeah. tell everyone to remember those is there's sasanqua camellias, which bloom now, and the, there's japonicas that bloom in the fall. And the trick that I always tell everyone to tell them apart is sasanquas have small leaves and japonicas have jumbo leaves. So the leaves on the japonicas are going to be much bigger, and the sasanquas have smaller leaves. Although, Devin, I saw um, Early Wonder is a camellia mm -hmm. that is a japonica that blooms now too. So yes, there's always Early Wonder. <laughs> yeah, there's always a few. Yeah, but it's still a japonica though. It's not a yeah a japonica, sustainable. but it's blooming now. Yeah, and debutante is another early blooming japonica that my yeah. debutante at home's already blooming. Also well, behind that here. is an enjoyia. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. And you can see yeah. how many buds are on that. Oh my mm -hmm. god, I love that. I'm plant. so excited about it. And I just also love, like, my friend Brie Arthur, she <laughs> taught me to also snip the flowers and just lay them then in a water bowl. And so you have the scent inside. Like, oh, I'm doing that this year. I got it as a tiny little stick. Like, I just bought it. And it's grown so much. So this is, it's like every year is a party when I see all the buds come out. Because I'm like, look at how many more there are this year. <laughs> It is crazy how fast Edgeworthias grow. Once they get established, they are like crazy They're growers. Monsters. Yeah. They're huge. And they do take well to pruning. They do take well to pruning. When are yeah. they going to um, bloom and what color? And are they fragrant? Yeah, mm. so fragrant. They, they are very, very early to bloom. So like in North Carolina, you'll get them like in January, February. They're white yeah. with a yellow center typically. And and even the buds, I feel like, are really pretty. They look like little ornaments just on the bare tree. Like, I can't wait for those leaves to fall off because they just look so good. Um, mm -hmm. Yay, fall color, but um, I'm more excited. But that's a thing to know that, like, Edgeworth Air will lose the leaves and then you have the blooms on it. Yes. Yes. All right. Super next, what's, um, what, oh, it went the wrong way. All right. What is this? I love this. I actually ended up hunting. I ended up planting this because of the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. They have like a huge drift of them and they're so pretty. Um, and you just, I think they're called, I call them tractor seat plants because they look like little tractor seats or they're also called like giant leopard plants. But I think the botanic name is Farfugum. Did I say it right? Or did I put yeah. Farfugium. That's a Farfugium. Oh, well, tractor seed is actually the cultivar name of this one. Oh, so look from Fujian's, um, but yeah, track to see this the cultivar. There's a lot that are also spotted, which are really, really cool. Ooh. The perennial oh, queen so is back. <laughs> I'm so glad oh, you're back. Carispa. I love, it. <laughs> I love Carispa. That's another great one. Uh, like and I would think one. that the biggest thing to point out is also like how you get something in your garden for pollinators late in the season. 
yeah. such a great plan for yourself. I'm really always said that like a lot of the perennial companies, like even the one I work for, we don't have them in our assortment because they're really only perennial, kind of like North Carolina down. Like yeah. if you get much further north, they don't work that well. Um, it's definitely one of those tongue breaker names though. Farfugium. Ooh, like look at that. You can, you can also use Farfugium as a house plant if you're more north. You can put it outside and then a pot and then move it in. I've seen Farfugiums and Spotty Dotty um, it, all sold as house plants. It kind of looks like a house plant. Like I'm not like mm-hmm. the leaves and it's so shiny. I don't know. And I actually Michelle, talk- I love I love your story about the reason why you like that plant is because of the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. That is one of my all-time favorite plants, and I have the same exact reason. I saw that <laughs> same swaw at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens right under the tree walk there. Yes, I yes. fell in love. I was like, what I is that? Just like, I have to have it. Exactly. Have it. It like, yeah, and they were really, they used to be really hard to find. Um, yeah. But a lot of growers have started growing them more now. Um, there was a liner shortage on them about a year or two ago, and nobody had them. Um, well, but luckily, they're back. Tell you my fun story, Devin. So yeah. there was a liner shortage, and as you know, I work for a liner company, and we brought out and um, that Mario, if you don't mind googling quickly a different plant for me, but we introduced a new plant called Tractor Seed, but it was a ligularia, and all oh, of a sudden no. I was like. I didn't know this would be such a popular plant. And like literally everybody started ordering this Ligularia tractor seed when they meant to order Perfugium. But now the Ligularia also really gained them popularity because they ordered it. They realized it was wrong. They still grew it and realized it is a really, really cool plant also for the South shade. But I thought it was so hilarious how if you only do cultivar names, it is an issue. Uh, you misspell it, Ligularia. With, uh, yep. Do you see the Walter Scruton site? Just go on that one down. Wait, wait which one? This one? It's, no, it says Walter Scruton's Ligularia Tractacy. Yep. So it's a huge one. Like literally, it looks like a John Deere tractor seed. So huge. So um, different from what you have in your garden. <laughs> but I thought it was just the perfect everyone- of why... Botanic names matter because you will order or get the wrong plant if you don't like be careful about that. Mm. Well, and the confusing thing. Sorry. No, you go ahead. I said the one of the confusing things about this plant is farfugiums used to be a ligularia until they made the farfugium class for all the farfugiums. So a lot of people do get Parfugium gigantia confused because like older growers like Monrovia is still listed as Ligularia instead of Parfugium. Can you like, I still don't understand. Can you say that again? I'm sure somebody else is having trouble with that. Like, I think you said it fine, but I'm slowed on the intake. Oh yeah. So, okay. So, and Kata can probably add some more on this too. So, the people who make the plant classification sometimes will go through and reclassify a plant. Um, Cause so Farfugium gigantia actually used to be Ligularia gigantia. So it used to be in the Ligularia family, but then they kind of found this class of plants and kind of broke them out and made their own class. And so now they're Farfugiums instead of Ligularia. And I think the reason for that is, I don't know, this is my personal opinion. I'm not a plant scientist, but to me, the ligularias have a much thinner leaf, and the farfugiums have a much thicker leaf, and are more of like semi evergreen. Where ligularias have a much thinner leaf and definitely go dormant with the first frost. So I don't know if that's why they've changed the classification, but they did used to be. They did. You may see farfugium gigantium as ligularia gigantium. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some other plants where they changed the names on them too. It gets really annoying when the plant people decide to change their names. Who are they? Change their families. Who are these? I don't people? know. I don't know. They confuse me. Well, um, yes. <laughs> she's back. I thought she was pissed <laughs> off at you. I'm so sorry. I saw my battery draining, but I was like, I'm so excited to tell you about my story, and then it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
Constant, can you think of any genuses that have changed names? Like they made a new classification for it, like for Fujium? Oh yeah. Sedum is now um, oh, yeah. a really, really long name. It is hypo Halotelethium. Halotelethium. Then Asters changed a lot. Um yeah, there's quite a few. Which is always it fun. Looks- like, yeah, they like to keep us on our toes. Games, but <laughs> yeah, because it's not just the U.S. Right? It has to be internationally changed. It's not just our USDA yeah. plant mm-hmm. people. <laughs> yeah, no, it is absolutely. Um, that's just the new botanic name, but yeah, yeah. So the the sedum was a little easier. It's all the upright sedums that kind of have changed. I think some of the lower ones have changed too, but that's like the more easy way for me to look at it. The S's, I think, are really, really complicated. There's like a bunch of new names. But here we are. The We're always going to learn something new. I think that not every nursery like immediately adapts to new names. So like, even though we are like, we keep up with the changes and we really look at them, you, typically you don't see those changes very quickly until they really get established. So like I highly doubt the regular homeowner goes into a garden center and will see hella little something. You will still see Luffle Luffle. See them. My dad is gonna come and- he hears this episode and he's like, You didn't know this new name, Shame on you. Don't come home. Stay in the U.S. Don't come home. home. You're not welcome. And like Devin says, plants don't read, so they don't know their classification changed. (laughs) But my dad sure does that his daughter just (laughs) embarrassed herself in this podcast not knowing the new name of Sedum. You'll have to read a few books in his library when you get home then. (laughs) Do a book report. Some light reading. (laughs) I'm gonna be a good girl and just read. Well, All right, folks. As as Kata escapes trouble uh, and Michelle navigates native plant talks, and Devin makes his way back to North Florida from Naples. I'm your host, Mario. We'll see you next time. Keep going and growing, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye.